We're super excited to have you today. This session is Legislating Hope, Moving the Needle Towards Better Care and Recovery. Um, and we have three incredible speakers today. Um, really excited to kind of um, have them here to share a little bit about what they're doing, um, specifically with Proxy Parent, um, Proxy Parent Foundation um, and their work specifically there. Um, in just a moment, I will actually be sharing a screen as well. Um, and we'll have their contact information up and we'll share it again at the end of um, the session as well. Uh, so Cherie and Randall uh, both serve on the Proxy Parent Foundation Board. Randall is the lead legislative advocate for the California Psychiatric Association and Cherie is the Vice President of Behavioral Health at California Hospital Association. Uh, both of them have valuable, valuable years and years of experience within and across the mental health system at large. So we are so excited to have their perspectives. Um, also joining us is Bruce Lewitt, um, who I will be passing it over to. He is the Managing Director for Proxy Parent Foundation, and he has over 25 years of experience managing mental health programs. He's also originally a documentary filmmaker. Um, so with that, um, I, I know you, you will be in great hands with these three incredible speakers. Um, please feel free to type in your questions into the chat box as we go, uh, and they will do their best to kind of answer them as they're uh, kind of speaking and also as they're coming up. So uh, with that, Bruce, if you're ready, go ahead. Thank you, Brianna. Well, Proxy Parent Foundation was created for you by families like yours who have faced the same challenges you've had to in helping their disabled loved ones navigate severe social isolation, homelessness, dysfunctional mental health bureaucracies, and so many other tough and demanding challenges. We admire your dedication and deeply respect your perseverance. We know and we understand. Our mission is to step in when you can no longer carry on. When you join our master pooled special needs trust, your loved ones become beneficiaries of the assets you provided for them. And these assets will be dispersed to them in a way that preserves and protects their public benefits. Additionally, Proxy Parent Foundation offers the option of a statewide, highly qualified team of skilled personal support specialists, Proxy Parents, who step into a family-like role to create a sense of security and stability in intuiting, intuiting and orchestrating everyday supplemental needs could be for a cell phone, a TV, a computer, internet service, clothing, auto expenses, furniture, bedding, plants, books, concert tickets, or other needs that are more individual, such as one of our beneficiaries is an aspiring singer songwriter. It's what gets him out of bed in the morning. We arrange for his special needs trust to pay for a modest mini recording studio in his board and care room. Another beneficiary wanted to learn Tai Chi. Her special needs trust pays for classes at a local dojo. We're also there when a beneficiary's needs become more critical, such as with medical appointments, hospitalizations, and the complex aspects of finding and maintaining affordable housing. And just as you've had to do, we often have to sometimes enforce limitations on compulsive expenses, or sometimes mediate uh, entanglements. For more information examples, please visit our website at proxyparentfoundation.org. Two members of Proxy Parent Foundation's Board of Directors, Randall Hager and Shri Lowe, whom Brianna introduced a short few moments ago, are here with me today to share their knowledge and apply their expertise and telling us about newly enacted mental health legislation, and also look ahead to additional legislation that may be introduced next year. These new mental health laws provide hope that change for the better is possible. How much things actually change won't be known until after these new laws are applied. But like you, I can't wait to hear about them. Randall? Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, I am Randall Hager. Um, uh, great to meet you all. Even though I can't see you, you can probably see me. Um, 
I am a former uh, NAMI Sacramento uh, member, uh, board member, uh, president of that affiliate and a NAMI California board member where I was the legislative director. So I have roots deep in NAMI and I am obviously a family member. Um, and while I was with NAMI, I, I, I took part in the development of two really critical pieces of inf information, or sorry, legislation. And one was the state uh, mental health parity law, and the other was Laura's law. And I'll be talking to you today about some really important and kind of exciting developments there, uh, as well as a new a law that's been uh, signed by the governor that has to do with peers and peer certifications and the utilization of peers in county uh, systems of care, uh, behavioral health care. So w without further ado, let me just make it really clear that um, I view the work that I do as representing the hopes and aspirations of families and consumers in the legislative sphere. And that's exactly you know, parallel to the role that the Proxy Parent Foundation plays in, for families. Um, so first, you know, my family story started many years ago to get me on this path um, where I was trying to get my son admitted to a hospital after a two week high, um, uh, run away from home. Uh, he was found um, many, many miles away from where I lived. Um, I went to pick him up and 12 hours later, um, I had actually presented him to the door of the Sacramento Treatment Center saying, He's had, a, he's had a really, you know, critical incident happen. He's um, been medicated. A doctor, a psychiatrist said I needed to bring him right back and get him um, admitted for treatment. And um, the facility wouldn't admit him. And that was my first introduction to the treatment laws. And uh, in specific, specifically 5150, because my son didn't want to go into the hospital. And so I... I you know, figured out there at the facility what I needed to say to get him admitted because he was a danger to himself and I was able to demonstrate that, get him admitted. And I, since then, I've been on a quest to understand our treatment laws. So let me start off by talking a little bit about the parity statute. There's a bill called SB 855, it's by Senator Weiner. It was just recently signed by the governor, and it takes parity enforcement and parity um, in the law to a whole new level. And this was necessary because after all these years, our original state parity law, which was enacted in 2001, um, still was not successful in its basic aim, which is in stopping discrimination against people with mental disorders and their families as far as their health services are concerned and more specifically the insurance that provides for that. So just really basically a definition. Uh, parity means that your services for everything from depression to anxiety to maybe bipolar or schizophrenia should be provided on the same terms and conditions as the health um, care that's provided for diabetes, for coronary heart, you know, heart, heart disease. Um, that's the basic principle, that it should be on the same terms and conditions. And it, when it is, then that causes discrimination to fall away. But unfortunately, discrimination still exists. So the story about this bill, SB 855, is that um, there was a lawsuit. It was called WIT versus United Behavioral Health. It was a class action lawsuit. And it found, um, it was just decided uh, early last year and the judge found that the United Behavioral Health was using flawed medical necessity criteria. That the United Behavioral Health folks were wrongly denying claims for treatment. And what they found was that the way United Behavioral Health had done this, 
is that it had kind of cooked the books on treatment standards. So where there might be national standards for how you treat depression or depression after you're, you're released from the hospital, um, where you stayed to have your you know, suicidal issues dealt with, um, those national standards were tweaked by the plan to benefit its basic bottom line. And the court actually was very frank in saying that. So we have an example of discrimination because this kind of stuff is not happening on the health side. Uh, if you have cancer, you have a heart condition, you have whatever, um, the same kind of fiddling, if you will, with the standards that should be applied to your care and should give you good care were, are not ignored. So the court did make this finding, and so that's why this law was necessary, because it basically incorporates the findings of the court there. And so I can't go into too much detail because I still have two other bills I'd like to cover, but you know, there are examples of, of, of medical, what they call medical necessity criteria. Um, and so, you know, you, you would expect that if you present with whatever issue, um, you know, that, that your coverage is going to provide you with a treatment that's appropriate. But what we in fact found and what this bill corrects was that United Behavioral Health wasn't treating the underlying condition. It was treating symptoms. So in depression, that might be just medication, but if you're beginning to have more and more severe symptoms of, of um, you know, depression, for instance, then you might need a little bit more therapy on the side with the medication. And United Behavioral Health was denying that. Um, so they were denying the, the everyday kind of routine care that would keep people stable, that would keep people from deteriorating. Uh, maintaining their function, preventing relapse. Um, these were all things that United Behavioral Health didn't seem to care a whole lot about, and which really, you know, caused the judge to be very, very critical of them. And so this bill actually provides a series of uh, criteria where plans have to get on the same page with all these national standards. They can't alter them to benefit their bottom line, um, and you get better treatment out of it at the end. That's the hope. It doesn't take effect until January of next year, but this is a, a, a really important new expansion of an anti-discrimination kind of effort in the uh, parity arena. And of course, this applies to commercial insurance. So your private insurance, if you have Anthem, Cigna, uh, Aetna, covering your healthcare. And I, will, I can take some questions about this. Um, I will be able to talk more about details maybe a little later, but let me move on uh, really quickly. Um, mostly, I think my notes say that, um, you know, the, the effect of this on Proxy Parent Foundation is that it affects Bruce and, and Cherie because we have private insurance. Um, it affects all our other board members. It affects the personal support specialists that are hired to take care of our beneficiaries. And so this is one of those things where we're hoping this makes all of our lives, as well as maybe your lives, better in terms of making it easier to access the care that you need. The next thing I want to talk about is actually the peer certification bill, and that's called SB 803 by Senator Weiner. This is a bill that we've been waiting for, for it seems like forever. It's probably the sixth version of the bill in probably eight years. And it was finally passed and finally signed by the governor. So it goes into effect next year too. And it would give consumers and families who have lived experience the ability to gain certification um, after um, some training and some education and become employed in the local mental health system that is operated by counties so that that lived experience could be put online and it can benefit 
those other people in the system who can benefit from having a peer around. And again, it applies equally to families and or um, the, the individuals with the mental illness. So this bill is really important. Um, it, it, it allows, you know, people to gain the respect and appreciation of having lived experience. It allows them to go home with a paycheck for that. It amplifies their personal experiences um, by adding in some education on things like developing safety and crisis plans, um, how to make referrals, um, how to deal with confidentiality, um, what are the you know, principles of recovery and how do they apply to me and others. And, you know, trauma-informed care and all these kind of new concepts that we're learning are so necessary in treatment. So this SB 803 is a really, really important development, and it should help us transform the kind of care that you find in, at the county level. And I can give more um, details if there are questions about that later. We are going to, um, I, I noticed we just had a parody question from my chat function, so let me take a quick look at that. Um, it's a question that's a little bit out of the bounds of the, uh, the bill itself, but it's a question about the severely mentally ill population and um, the developmentally disabled population, and when can we get parity between those two systems of care? What we're dealing with here is that the developmentally disabled population a long time ago was developed a system of care that's basically an entitlement. Entitlement means what you need, you get. I mean, theoretically, at least on paper. And the system of care for people with severe mental illness didn't develop with an entitlement. These services are available to the extent that funding is available. And so that is a crucial difference between the two systems of care. And I can't get into that a whole lot more at this point, but the, um, the person who asked the question is Linda uh, Linder. Um, is absolutely right. There is a disparity. There is discrimination. We're not getting what we need on the severe mental Ill, mentally ill treatment side. So let me just sort of segue to my third bill, which is the Laura's Law bill. Again, this is something as a NAMI California board member, I actually helped develop with the staff in the legislature so that it's been on the books for 18 years. And finally, after 18 years, Laura's Law was made permanent. And it is now going to apply to all counties with, you know, a caveat. But let me just roll back a little bit and make sure people understand what Laura's Law is. It is a system of treatment that is court supervised. It's court supervised intensive services. And it is, very, very appropriate for people who don't realize that they're sick and keep getting in the, in, in the hospital. Um, they keep getting arrested. They may even get out of control and make threats or commit acts uh, of violence. And for anyone who has a history that sounds like that, they can be offered these voluntary services, but if they don't you know, as they can be offered these services, excuse me, as voluntary services, but they're not going to accept because they don't believe they're ill. And so that's where Laura's Law is really important. It does take those people who lack insight and provides them the structure of court supervision with intensive services. And it's very, very good in providing outcomes. So reductions in, in hospitalization, days in the hospital, um, reduction in arrests, reduction in um, encounters with the police, and it can also lead to um, a lot better medication uh, adherence or, you know, compliance, if you will. Um, it leads to more stable housing, so it's appropriate for the homelessness issue. 
Um, so it's a very, very effective tool. It's not a tool for everybody, but it's a small tool that does work very well. And so this year it became permanent. Um, it's gonna to apply to all counties. Counties can, however, um, joint, you know, um, decide that they wanna opt out, but then they have to go through a procedure and the procedure for you to know if that's one of, if you're in one of the counties, 20 counties have it, um, the rest of the 58 do not. If you're in one of those counties, you know, you're going to um, be looking at implementation. Your county's kind of dragging their feet. Looks like they're not gonna do it. They still have to engage you. They have to engage in public hearings. This is what the bill says. This is what AB 1976 says. It says um, they have to engage you. They have to engage in a public process. They have to have a hearing. Um, and if they're gonna not do it, they have to actually put the facts and circumstances on the record as to why they're not going to do it. But that's after engaging you instead of just saying, now nah, we're not gonna do it and there's no public process, this requires, AB 1976 requires a public process. And 1876, uh, 1976, sorry, also allows smaller counties to do it jointly. So if you live in a small rural county and you don't have a lot of resources, you can knock at the door on the next door county and say, hey, you want in? Maybe the two of us can run one, one program. And that's, this makes that possible. It also allows judges. And where do our family members end up when they're in trouble? Often in court, criminal court. And it allows criminal court as, uh, as well as other judges to make the referrals to Allura's Law program when they exist in the county. This is a first. Um, other people can make those referrals, family members, you know, uh, other people who might live in the same house, uh, treatment professionals and facilities. Um, so now um, judges are added to that list and judges who see our, our family members way too often can actually say, you know, I don't, I, you're, you've been in my court a lot. I don't like that. You don't like that. I think there's a better option for you. I'm going to make a referral to an assisted outpatient treatment or Laura's Law program. So those are my three bills. Those are things that I think encourage hope. And I'm going to turn it over to Sheree for her to talk about a couple of things um, that I think you'll also be very excited by. Sheree, take it away. Thanks, Randall. I think there's a, uh, there's a question in the chat that is very relevant to what you were just speaking to. It, it, the question is, many parents are falling in the cracks because they don't fit into the category. Uh, for example, not having a criminal record, not having substance abuse issues, or the child is not in foster care, um, but they're in the family court system. And the question is, how different is that bill from the Mental Health Diversion Act bills? Well, I, you know, I, it, it's, um, I, okay, so valid issue being identified here, there, there's another population of people who are not getting the kinds of treatment that um, they need, the kinds of resources, the kinds of supports. And obviously family reunification is very important. Um, those are things that unfortunately we don't have real solid mechanisms to deal with right now. And you're right. Um, these are examples of discrimination. If, if there's a mental illness involved in these and they should be addressed on that basis. But unfortunately our, our, our laws that are on the books are not very helpful in those specific situations. But it is two different programs. Yes the court diversion versus the assisted outpatient treatment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, uh, Randall. And uh, I, I need to thank NAMI for asking Proxy Parent to present and to be available to all of you. And Bruce, thank you for reaching out and asking me to co-present with Randall. Um, our topic, Legislating Hope, is not tongue in cheek. Uh, most of the delivery system in the behavioral health space um, has come about because of legislation. And uh, the role that Randall and I both play for our respective organizations is coming up with legislation that helps improve the delivery system. The California Hospital Association, who I've worked for for 
I'm on my 18th year. Um, obviously, is an advocacy organization that looks to make the healthcare delivery system better. And my specific role with the association is in the behavioral health space. There are about 400 hospitals in California. Most of those hospitals have emergency departments. And emergency departments are seen on any given day. There are about 6,600 individuals in emergency departments with a behavioral health diagnosis. And we're really trying hard as an association representing all of our hospitals to make that experience better for the consumer themselves and for the family member. No one wants to go to an emergency department. I don't want to go to an emergency department. I avoid it at all costs. Um, but sometimes, especially with our involuntary commitment statute in the state, um, sometimes emergency departments are the only place available and open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The lights are always on. There's always people there. You can always get a sandwich. There's always someone to talk to. So it's a natural place for people to go. The problem is our emergency departments were not designed to treat behavioral health conditions at the level we are being asked to treat them. Um, we are very much, emergency departments are very much based on a physical health model, not a mental health model. So as an association for years, we have been trying to improve the work that our staff in the emergency departments do with respect to helping people on LPS involuntary holds that present in our emergency departments. We've sponsored legislation on our own before. We've made some incremental changes, but last year we decided to partner with NAMI California and they decided to partner with us to get a piece of legislation submitted into the system that would require our county mental health partners to be responsive when an emergency department calls and says, we need, we have someone here that law enforcement has brought in, they're on an involuntary hold, we need an assessment of their condition. And we were sometimes having to wait extraordinarily long lengths of time to get the county behavioral health departments or their contractors in to do the assessment that is required when someone is placed by law enforcement on a 5150 hold. So we started, we developed the language, we partnered with NAMI. It was all going really well until the pandemic hit. And obviously the pandemic put a screeching halt to many pieces of legislation this year. And we did not want our piece of legislation to become a victim of the pandemic. So we sat down and we reconstructed the legislation and amended it so that it would allow telehealth and the use of technology to be a permissive way for our county mental health partners and their contractors to do the assessments that are needed in the 5150 involuntary hold space. And I'm happy to say that we, we were successful in getting that legislation to the governor's desk. The governor has signed that legislation and it goes into effect in January. And basically, basically what it will allow is that every patient brought into an emergency department on a 5150 hold can have a telehealth assessment of that hold was the law enforcement officer that detained and transported that person right or wrong. That's the 5150 assessment. So we can now do all of those by telehealth if necessary. The next uh, evaluation that is to occur is a 5151 evaluation. And that evaluation is if we've determined under the 5150 that law enforcement was correct, that this person does pose a danger to themselves or others or is so gravely disabled by their condition that they can't take care of their needs. Then the next question 
And next determination is, well, do they need to go to a community placement for treatment or do they need to go involuntarily into a inpatient psychiatric hospital for treatment? And that's a 5151 assessment. That now in January will also be able to be done with telehealth technology. And we're hoping that one, it, it really improves the amount of time that someone is languishing in an emergency department waiting to get to the right level of care. So in January, all of our hospitals, if necessary, if they don't have a psychiatrist on staff in the emergency department, will be able to use technology to reach out to a clinician that is trained in 5150 and 5151 uh, assessments and evaluation and get the individual that's in the ED directed to the right level of care. So now it's gonna be about operationalizing the law. It's one thing to have the law in the books, it's another thing for it to actually work in practice. So that's what's being worked on now. We have been successfully doing it since March when the COVID pandemic hit. Um, there was an executive order signed that allowed telehealth to be the technology used. And we've been doing great. I think patients are getting, treat, getting into treatment much faster and they're getting out of the emergency departments much faster. Happy to answer any questions that anyone has. I'm gonna check the chat. I think we're good. I've been watching that. Um, Thank you. There's a question about Laura's Law. I think I'll defer that for, for just a bit if you wanna continue. Three. That was the bill that I was scheduled to talk about, Randall. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so um, the question from the chat is, have the qualifying criteria for Laura's Law been changed at all? And it's a really interesting question. Um, it's, it's, it's not answered completely if I say no, not at least in AB 1976, but it's an interesting question because there was a state audit of how the LPS Act, which includes 5150s and everything from there up to conservatorships, but there was an audit of how well that system is working. Now the audit had some flaws, but one of the interesting things um, they said is that Laura's law should be, uh, drum roll please, they anticipated 1976, they, should, they said it's a good program, really good program, and it should go statewide. And so we, we're, we've sort of done that. Um, but the qualifying criteria for Laura's law were not affected by 1976. However, the state auditor did suggest that there are way too many people who are on multiple 5150s. So they go in on a 5150, they come out, they've been treated, they're stabilized, but then they go in again on the 5150. And if they have this kind of pattern that, that um, for many people is five, six, seven times a year, the auditor said that the criteria should be altered. So this is where this, this question comes in. The auditor said that it should be altered to give um, access to assisted outpatient treatment uh, to these individuals who are on these revolving door 5150s who are not otherwise being helped by community programs. So there is a move afoot for next year to look at the criteria, see what it would take um, to be able to intervene um, even earlier in the process of a person's deterioration. Maybe if there is um, just a good, you know, a, a compelling reason to say that they're at risk of deteriorating, which is one of the criteria for Laura's Law. So if they're at risk for deteriorating, and they have this history and they've been pushing the 5150 revolving door awfully hard, maybe we should be providing them some of the benefits of, of court supervised treatment. And I think that's a great idea. I personally think that that's the next step. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see legislation in 2021 that did address the criteria and, and, and allowed it to be a little bit broader to help with these things. Um, it's interesting that the criteria were also suggested to be broadened or changed by the auditor in the area of conservatorships because the same issue um, it was identified there by the, by the auditor, which is that people benefit from a conservatorship. They're there maybe for a year, conserved. Um, they get very stable. Um, then the conservatorship is lifted. It's not continued for, say, a second year. And those people then travel a journey where they're back before the conservatorship court again, and another conservatorship is placed on them. And so there's a pattern there too, and the, and the um, auditor identified that and said also that the Laura's Law criteria should be altered and developed in a more broad way so that these individuals could gain the benefit of the court supervision, which is much more active in an assisted outpatient treatment court than it would be for in a conservatorship court. Um, so I think that's probably more than you expected in, in the way of an answer, but that's, the, that's all the information I have on that at this point in time. Um, so expect some changes in 2021. I'm, I'm seeing some questions about my presentation, and I think I even forgot to tell you what the bill number was. Um, it was Assembly Bill 3242. So that was the 51... 50 bill and it doesn't require anything new there's no new assessments it's really the ability for hospitals that don't have ready availability or county behavioral health departments that don't have um, access to individuals to present at the emergency department and provide the assessments that are necessary to, to move people along in the hospital world we call it throughput. And one of the other questions that I, I see coming up is what can advocates do to, to help solve the emergency room boarding problem? Um, you know, throughput is a huge issue. So the standard in an emergency department, the gold standard, is that no one should be in an emergency department more than four hours. From, that, from the time you present to the emergency department, to the time that you move on in your treatment. It should be no more than four hours. And we know even today, especially today, we have people that are staying days, sometimes weeks in the emergency department. And that's a tragedy. No one wants that. The emergency department doesn't want it. The patient certainly doesn't want to be there for days. And the family certainly don't want it. And the, there, there are a variety of reasons why that happens, but the most common reason is that there isn't a safe placement discharge option for the individual. And there are a variety of reasons why there are not safe and appropriate discharge, discharge, op, discharge options. And that often boils down to there, we just don't have an adequate array of treatment settings in the community, whether it be a residential treatment, a crisis residential, whether it be a board and care facility. I know that our county mental health plans uh, deal a lot with network adequacy and they're being held to, to relatively new federal network adequacy standards. Um, I also just read a release from the Department of Healthcare Services that recently they surveyed the counties to determine their network adequacy for Medi-Cal recipients. And 13 of the counties were able to identify and prove that they had an adequate network. And the rest of the counties, which would be 48, uh, or wait, 45, uh, were not able to identify and prove that they had an adequate network. So when there's no place for someone to go, the place of last resort, unfortunately, is an emergency department. 
and it's not right, but that is the system that we are working in today. Our challenge is if emergency departments are going to be the place of last resort, then we need to give them the resources and the tools that they need to do a much better job taking care of the individuals that are being entrusted to our care. And we need our health plans, both our government health plans and our commercial health plans to take a much more engaging role in making sure that the levels of care that are needed for someone in the behavioral health space outside of a hospital are available and available to anyone. So let me just say, Bruce, did you see the proxy parent question there? No, it really wasn't. Yes, I know I can see it, but it says if a person does not need a special needs trust, will you distribute funds periodically or pay for needs like housing and assistance? Uh, we can only pay for those needs that are provided for in the trust. So for any needs that are in which there are no funds in a special needs trust, we're unable to pay for those expenses. The, the other question, Bruce, for you was, um, are, is the Proxy Parent Foundation plan only open to Californians or is it available nationwide? It is only open to Californians. The laws different, uh, differ from state to state. So a lot of, so if a family is gonna establish a special needs trust for a family member here and who lives in California, terrific. If they're trying to set up a special needs trust for a beneficiary who lives in New Mexico, they need to establish that trust in New Mexico. However, the question is what happens when a beneficiary with a trust here in California moves to another state, whether it be Texas, New York, Arizona, and that we look at um, on a situation by situation basis. Um, we don't abandon the beneficiary just because they've moved out of state. Um, we will try to find services for them in another state, but we can't provide direct personal support services to a beneficiary who's not living in California because we can't provide the administration and the oversight that we'd like to provide. So I'm going to take another question here. Uh, this came up yesterday when I was presenting um, on Laura's Law. Um, and it really has to do with, um, you know, particular counties that are not cooperating and, with families and families have private insurance. And that private insurance um, could be billed for a 5150 for a hospital stay, and yet the county is not supplying documentation or any kind of assistance to the family, but instead uh, finding that they're privately insured, turning around and billing the family. Um, I, I think this is not a new practice and it's not happening in every county. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I think that the, the way that you have to get attention onto this problem in an in, is is within the individual county and to actually take it up a step and go to your elected um, official there on the board of supervisors and saying that you're not getting the cooperation that you need to get this taken care of through private insurance i think it's going to take that kind of advocacy and i'm sorry to have to say that um, it's a it's a it's an issue that doesn't come up very often but for those who do i think it it raises the prospect of potential bankruptcy i mean who can pay a thousand dollars plus a day for a long hospitalization especially if that happens uh several times and the county is not being cooperative and supplying the documentation that would get that reimbursed by the health plan I mean, that's really I think, tragic. The, I think we need to be very clear too. The Lanterman and Petrus Short involuntary commitment laws, LPS 5150 law in general, gives the responsibility for all payers to our county mental health plans. It doesn't say that they have to absorb the cost 
of doing the evaluations and assessments for commercial health coverage. But it says that they are the, the county mental health system is the infrastructure backbone to the 5150 statute. And we know that our county mental health systems are underfunded. So we really don't want our counties to have to be paying for people that, for, for paying for services rendered to commercially insured individuals. We want the commercial plans to pay their fair share. So I don't disagree that in Marin County that they, what, what the mental health plan is doing. What I do disagree with is if they're not providing the family members with the resources that they need to get reimbursed. And I think if you do a, you know, a well uh, articulated letter to the county mental health director in Marin um, and spell out exactly what you need and your willingness to submit to your insurance so that you can get reimbursed, I think that they will accommodate your request. And I'm happy to help you if you'd like to send me a separate email. I, I, I still think you copy it at the very least to the county supervisor. Oh, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you uh, not follow through <laughs> with Randall's suggestion. I'm just saying that I understand where our county mental health plans are coming from. They have this, they have the responsibility, but they don't, they shouldn't have to show, shoulder the burden of the cost. And that's why we always encourage families to sign their family members up for Medi-Cal to avoid that problem with the private insurance companies, because um, it, it happens, it happens so often. Um, so yes, why yeah. You know, so why not just um, avoid that issue, jettison the private payer, and sign up for Medi-Cal? Um, if if the private insurers are simply not going to respond, or the and the and the patient is not going to get the care that he needs, um, or the family is going to get um, tagged with enormous expenses, like Randall said, could indeed bankrupt them. Um, those are costs that need to be shifted to the public system. And um, families have, will have Medi-Cal as a primary payer and, set, and the private insurance as a, as a secondary, some combination of both. Um, and that's one reason why families do sign up for special needs trust, because they do want their family members not to have those type of assets that would preclude they're signing up for Medi-Cal. Excellent point. So um, another, another comment was made about the how rapidly hospitals um, re release individuals that are on involuntary holds. Um, no one wants to release anyone early. Uh, the reality is our payers, whether they be Medi-Cal or commercial insurance, they are the ones that dictate someone's length of stay in a hospital. It is not the hospital that's dictating the length of stay. Trust me, we agree that we are releasing patients way too early um, and trying to see the effects of a new medication regime on a patient in five days is not realistic when we know it often takes much longer than that. Sharia, at what point does a 5151 take place after how many days um, in the hospital, in the emergency room? The 5151 takes place. So the first thing that happens is you have a 5150. The law enforcement has detained someone and transported them to an emergency department. Right. The first decision is, was the cop right or wrong? So that's the first evaluation was, you know, does the person meet? the criteria for an involuntary hold. That's decision number one. Then the second decision is if they do meet the 5150 criteria for involuntary detainment, do they need a level of care that is hospitalized level? 
72 hours in a hospital? Right. Or can they be served voluntarily in the community? Right. So that's Sharif, the threshold. You've got a question also about effective date of 3242? January 1st, 2021. And that's statewide? Statewide. All right. There we go. Got that one. All right, um, let's see here. Moving down the line here, looks to me like we got a question about schools and an audit there. Um, it does not surprise me that, the, that there is a complete fail across the board for the thousand plus school districts in terms of um, supplying um, adequate mental health treatment uh, to pupils. Um, this has been a problem that's been ongoing for at least 20 years going back to the time when Willie Brown was a speaker of the assembly. And I don't even remember that myself. So that's been a long time. Um, I, what I do know is that um, this is the first attempt to try to create some transparency and trying to figure out what we're doing in the state with at least a half a billion dollars that's being supplied to the you know, departments of education statewide for pupil mental health. Um, so that, that, that audit was first of all, very necessary and two, it's really um, not something I've personally been involved in, although I think it's an extraordinarily important issue. And so I'm not aware of anybody's intention to take audit findings and to turn them into uh, legislation for next year, for instance. But um, now that you've brought that up, I'm going to go back and take another look at that audit and then maybe do some reaching out and we'll figure out if somebody's going to do something. It could be a project that you know, somebody here listening, you know, NAMI California, the hospitals or psychiatrists or somebody um, would entertain um, applying some leverage through the legislature. So, Randall, there's a comment about hospitals um, releasing individuals and, and admitting patients that were originally on an involuntary hold. And once they get to the inpatient hospital, the hospital offering to admit the patient on a voluntary basis. Um, who, the, the commenter is actually absolutely correct. When we admit a patient into an inpatient psychiatric hospital, we would prefer that we admit them under a voluntary status. Because as you all know, the sooner someone wants to receive care and treatment, the sooner their recovery journey can begin. So yes, hospitals often offer for an individual to come in and stay voluntarily for treatment. And sometimes those patients choose to come in voluntarily and it's a great experience for everyone. Other times they come in voluntarily and have to convert to an involuntary status while they're there because the hospital has to determine that they are not safe to leave on their own and the hospital themselves will invoke a 72 hour hold. So we're not trying to discharge early. Um, that's not the reason to not put someone on a hold. We, we prefer not to have someone on a hold because that tells us that they are engaged in the beginning of their recovery process. But by the same token, when it's, when it's clear that they're not going to engage voluntarily, I think that's always where you start. Um, to try to get that engagement, um, when it, it's clear that they meet criteria, then you want to bring in the evaluation, you want to get the 5150 started. Again, you want to do that as quickly as possible so that um, they can start heading down the road to treatment. Okay, so I'm scrolling through more questions. Keep them coming, folks. I don't know anything about Proposition J. That's a local initiative, and I don't know anything about it either. Um, it's not a statewide initiative.
So um, there's an issue of medical state stability and, and being able to achieve that before you can be transferred to a psych hospital. I know, uh, Sheree, you and I have talked about this. This is a little bit of a murky area in the law, which is you know, whether or not a medical facility treating a medical issue for somebody who also might qualify for 5150 uh, is entitled to actually enforce the hold in, in that uh, facility. I know that's one issue that's kind of embedded in that question. Um, and I think that you're in a position maybe to answer that a little bit better than I am. I am not sure what question you are referencing, Randall. Okay, comes from Don, Don. 143. I mean, I think it's embedded there. There's a couple of questions you could tease out. I'm sorry, I'm just not seeing it. I okay. apologize. All right, I'm going to jump down to, to Mark's comment. Is there any proposed legislation to give individuals who have unintentionally run afoul of criminal statutes a third option beyond jail or psych hospitals? That's exactly what Laura's law does. Um, it does give, and as I said, now criminal court judges will be able to say, I want you out of my court. I'm going to uh, hold you in the jail, but I'm going to make a referral to the AOT court, and if they accept you, then um, you're going to have access to treatment. And I know that's been the problem that's brought you here before me. Um, that option is so critical. It does offer um, a reasonable chance at a diversion. Um, unfortunately, the person is there in jail in the first place. There are some localities that actually will divert individuals um, before they get to the courtroom, before they actually get, um, ar you know, arrested, or not arrested, but before they get booked. And, you know, I think one of those um, jurisdictions is Santa Clara County, which actually has a kind of a mental health court right there at the jail, and people can be brought in, evaluated, they can see somebody about their legal issues, and they're not in the jail per se, but it's a treatment facility that deals with folks with uh, severe mental illness. That's a model worth replicating in, in um, all jurisdictions. And Randall, are those in Santa Clara County, are those um, individuals given a choice to comply with treatment or stay in the criminal justice system? You know, I think the, um, the existence of that facility right outside the jail, it provides, opens up the doors to a lot of options. And so, um, you know, they, they do have a choice. And most people, even when they're very psychotic, um, when given the, when, when told they're, you know, that they're about to go to jail, um, but they have an option not to go to jail. That option not to go to jail is a kind of a default for many, many folks. Um, and that's kind of the genius. It's kind of like, which door do you want to go in? Here's the door to the jail, or here's the door to this facility where there are a lot of nice people and there's kind of, you know, there's a home-like setting and there are some counselors and they'll talk to you and they'll help you sort out your issues, uh, maybe even help you feel better in the process. You know, that's a, that's a pretty powerful inducement there. Randall, we're, we're about two minutes um, from our shutoff time. And I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that the California Hospital Association um, is going to continue with our legislative advocacy. And we'll probably have another bill next year that, tr that, that we are going to try to introduce that will help improve the delivery system for behavioral health consumers in our emergency departments and in our inpatient psychiatric hospitals. I know Randall and I've talked about a whole bunch of different ideas. We, you know, the, it's the end of the session, right? We're done for this year. Uh, we'll start up again with a, a new two-year session and hopefully uh, we'll have a much better handle on COVID by then. Um, but. Randall and I are committed to continuing to work to improve the delivery system and the hospital association looks forward to partnering with NAMI 
and um, doing things that work for family members to help uh, the consumers that we're serving um, have a much better experience moving forward. So thank you all for the opportunity to talk with you today. And don't forget Proxy Parent Foundation. Yeah, please contact us. And please visit our website. Have a look around. Thank right. you so much, Bruce, Randall, and Cherie. Again, um, here is the information, proxyparentfoundation.org. And they've also um, been gracious enough to put their emails. So if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out directly to um, the presenter who might be able to best answer your question. Um, so thank you again so much and to everyone for your meaningful dialogue and your amazing questions. It really helped to move the conversation forward.